back off the rig and he got us off the rig and that fish took off away from the rig and, I and dude he's catching these like 40 50 kilogram northern pike on the fly competing with dudes that are conventional fishing so how how did the fly trap come to fruition i've got an 80 year old skin mount tarpon that at one point we thought like oh we're gonna fix this and it's gonna be cool but i want to catch one so bad. I, I have yet to catch a grass carp ha ha you finally didn't <laughs> catch a giant first fish welcome to wildlife outdoors with your host russell and jose if you have a passion for conservation of the outdoors, or you're enjoying a calming hike in the mountains, an exhilarating kayak trip on the river, feeling a fish on the end of your line, cooking on an open flame in a primitive campsite, or stalking big game, just waiting for the perfect shot, you're in the right place. So put on your boots and polarized sunglasses and come along for the ride. Welcome back to another episode of Wildlife Outdoors. Got another exciting one for you here. So I'm Russell. With us, as always, is Jose. And today we got an exciting one with Mr. Chris Fowler of the Fly Trap down in Rockport, Texas. How you doing, man? Good, man. How y'all doing? Doing, doing pretty good, good, man. So we all know that you're a fishy feller, but for some of our listeners that for some reason might <laughs> not know you, um, I mean, tell us a little bit about yourself. How'd you get started in fishing? Oh, shit. Started in fishing. That goes way back. Uh Man, I grew up on the Gulf Coast, Corpus Christi, Texas. Fishing was just always something we did from the time I can remember, you know, three, four years old, fishing on my grandmother's pier in North Padre. But, mm -hmm. man, it's just always been a part of my life. And no matter where I'm at, that's always like one of the stipulations of living there is I have to be able to fish. So since three years old, man, I'd say I've been fishing and been fly fishing since about 2013 2014 nice. um but man i traveled the the u.s for a number of years doing kayak bass fishing tournaments conventionally uh as i kind of got into fly fishing started bringing the long rod into these tournaments and uh man just kind of just fell completely in love with fly fishing and it's been non-stop since then i'm not a purist i'll still go kill some shrimp and sit on the pier with the buddies all night long and yeah i'll throw a spoon at the jetties all day but fly fishing is where my my heart is at nowadays so nice. yeah that's basically how i am guided in the texas hill country for carp on the fly rod for a number of years uh basically prior to covid and into covid um because i was furloughed from orvis austin that i was working at there and when I went furlough, I had to figure something out. And no matter how much people say they dislike carp, they paid my rent during some of the hardest times of my life. So I'll never yeah. not like carp, you know? <laughs> See, that's one thing. I don't understand why people hate carp. Like, that is one of my favorite fish to catch. Granted, I live in an area where they're basically right behind where I live. So that makes it yeah. easy for me to love them. But they are just so much fun to catch. They are, man. And, dude, it's, it's America, like – no matter where you're at in America, if there's a body of water that doesn't dry up throughout the year, fuck, even if it does dry up throughout the year, somehow there's always carp present. And some of my earliest memories, man, are like flicking pieces of corn into a freshwater pond on Lake Mathis and catching a carp on a Zebco or a Shamu rod <laughs> and just being like, holy shit, like they're so much fun. And it doesn't matter how old I get, like those fish are always going to be fun to me. Right. And people don't give brown trout shit. They're just yeah. different, just as invasive. Yep. We're all invasive, dude. Like, get over it, you know? <laughs> exactly. Ain't that the truth? Everybody's like, oh, brown trout are so amazing. And I mean, there's people that I've talked to that are like gung ho fly fishermen for trout, and they didn't even know that brown trout weren't from here. <laughs> it's like, yep. you fish for them all the time. You'd think you'd, you know, know a little bit about them. I mean, dude, even like uh, like the stalker rainbows on the Guadalupe, people pay buku money just to go fish like a, I don't know, 10-mile stretch of that river or whatever So it much is. money. <laughs> dude, it's insane. And then I think rainbows, at least in the U.S., they're like a – more of like a – for lack of a better term, like a manufactured fish to some degree, aren't they? Like, I, I mean, there's, I there's definitely wild rainbows here. You know, don't get, yeah. me, don't get me wrong, but there is a much larger – pellet eater stalker trout <laughs> yeah 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 dude and i mean i i think going back to your point russell like 
I will say when it, before I really started understanding like uh, and appreciating the fish for like I guess individually like the species, I used to look at carp as trash fish, dude. I didn't like them. I just you know it's like you know we need to get rid of these things, whatever. But that was my own ignorance. And uh, but yeah, man, I just feel like a, that is kind of what it is. People just they they have this trash fish moniker and they they look at them as such, but. And maybe because they don't have like a food value, even though some people still, you know, they do eat them, they do like them, but dude, they are so much fun to catch or fish for. They're so hard. It's, and like, like I love fishing for them. I still haven't caught my first actual common carp yet, but we got to change that. We got to change that. I know, man, but it's just like I've been obsessed with, with trying to get one for the last two years, three years, whatever it was. But it's crazy. I think, I think most of that became because of fly fishing. Because when I was conventional fishing, I didn't give two shits if I hooked one or not. But I was all well, the I mean, stuff. I used to guide for them um, Europe, European style uh, with 12, 13 mm. foot long spinning rods, casting a eight ounce ball of oatmeal corn big red and other shit a hundred yards out and catching them and that's just a sitting and waiting game but dude it was so technical and the way the rigs were made and the minutia of all the bits and bobbles and gear and then to lump it all up you get like these matching badass bags and it was just like full nerd out man and they call them <laughs> they call them tarts <laughs> like in the scene they're called tarts and those are the guys that like have to have the matching luggage and all one brand of shit. And it's just like for a, a gear nerd, Euro style carp fishing is like the end all be all of it. Like you, I've got still to this day, probably $7,000 worth of shit in my boat stores. It hasn't seen the light of day for almost four years now. <laughs> Dude, and, yeah. and maybe it's a regional thing. Cause yeah, those, they, those Euro, like European carp fishing is huge. Like it's they got huge. it dialed, man. Like I've seen some of those rigs that they've used are so sophisticated. It's crazy. It's, it's nuts, insane. man. And to look at it from like a different country standpoint, like Americans from the day we're born, basically if you're in a fishing family, you're taught to like demonize these fish. Yeah. Whereas in every other place in the world, except for like Australia and where they're like catch and kill, you you have to kill them. Every other country, that's their largemouth bass, dude. Like yeah. these fish live 40, 50 years. There's literal cities built around these ponds to fish for these named gigantic upwards of a hundred pound common carp and mirror carp, which are the same species, but we'll talk about all that shit later. But, you know, it's a completely different industry it's a billion multi-billion dollar industry in the uk and russia and the netherlands and like it's crazy that here they're basically looking at us like we're completely stupid and we chase <laughs> these stupid green fish that'll literally eat a piece of shit on a hook that you drag <laughs> across the surface but like i don't know it's just it's insane to me i mean even i told you the story of catching them as a kid throwing some corn out catching them like having so much fun and then dad's like those are trash fish like <laughs> i'm like what like this was so much fun dude like right and <laughs> you see the bend it put in this rod yeah, what man. trash fish <laughs> but yeah it just blows my mind man that there's a multi-billion dollar industry everywhere else in the world but in here we're like nah fuck those things kill them throw them on the bank <laughs> like, yeah, it's right stupid and on the fly man it's just so much more intimate and more hunting than it is fishing. Oh, and absolutely. That's, that's what I love about it. You know, making a 40, 50 foot shot to a fish in a shallow crystal clear embankment is really cool. But my favorite part was getting as close as I can to that fish and literally just like, here, buddy, like setting it in front of him when he eats it, just whack. <laughs> like that was the game for me because being in the water with them is super hard to do. I know a couple guys that do it really well and they walk like herons and they walk super slow. Danny Scarborough, like that dude is a fucking carp wizard when it comes to being in the water with them. And isn't like the carp is pretty much just one big sensory organ. Like they're super sensitive to movement. They have incredible smell. They even have really good eyesight. So there's just really like good eyesight. They actually have a pretty in comparison to other fish species, a relatively large brain, but they have the thicker, thickest lateral line of any species of fish on the planet. 
Yeah, I remember hearing something like it's nine times the size of any other lateral line of any other fish or something like that. And yeah. I don't know that I'd say they're like essentially like what you said, like a, a living sensor. I would say a catfish is more because they're scaleless. They're basically a living tongue, but they are extremely wary and have really good eyesight and feel vibrations and electric pulses more than most other fish species. And that's what that's why that getting close game to me is so much fun. It's like it's like bow hunting a species you probably shouldn't bow hunt, you know, or getting really close to it. And yeah, it's, it's part of the game, man. It's part of the love. And it really translates down here to chasing redfish and other species, sheep's head, you know, as equally frustrating, if not more. So did your, you growing up on the Gulf coast, did that translate pretty well to you living in the Austin area and fishing for carp up there? No, not at all. So I was a beach rat, man. Like we were jetty mm. kids growing up, like, my mother used to dye me and my little brother's hair like neon colors, like tennis ball green or bright blue <laughs> so that she could sit at the truck and chill and drink beer with everybody and look over and a mile down the beach still see the little green hair kid. <laughs> or she could see us out on the jetties. You know what I mean? So when I moved to Austin, dude, I was like, oh, shit, I, I don't know what I'm doing. Like, I think like the first time I fished in Austin, I had like a bait bucket, like a pull behind wading bait bucket that I went into Petco and bought goldfish and was like freelining them under bobbers in Barton Springs. Like I had no <laughs> idea what I was doing when I got there. I mean, we catfished growing up and through caught cart, but bassing was not a, not a big thing for us. You know, like to me, a bass back then was just a perch. Like we weren't catching big ones. They were all little dinks. You're like, ah, oh, there's one of those green perch. Right. A little ditch in the water. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Yeah, that's uh so I haven't fished much in the coast. So my family has some property down actually in Rockport, well, on Copano Bay, Holiday Beach. And nice. um so uh I spend a bit of time down there, but every time I'll go down there, it's the same thing. It was either surf fishing out with, you know, whether it be crack crab or mullet, or we'd be out at the jetties chunking spoons. And uh Hell so yeah. I, I I've never done much saltwater fishing, um, or fly fishing in the salt, but yeah, I was always out there soaking something or throwing a spoon. It's addicting, man. It's still fun, you know. It is for e sure. Even as a salty fly angler now, I don't turn my nose up to it. Yeah, I give my bait guide buddies a bunch of shit, but that's because they make <laughs> a living doing it, you know. <laughs> but <laughs> right. Yeah, dude. I uh, I, I want to get down there and do some more saltwater fly fishing. But so when you were out, were you fishing rigs a couple months ago, or you were out deep when you caught that cobia? What'd you catch it on? Was that conventional or fly? That was on fly. Um, it's actually the second cobia I've hooked. Um, I took a trip a few years ago and like, that was the goal was like, I want to see tarpon and I want to see and have a shot at a cobia on the fly. And literally the first pipe we pulled up to, there was like a 60 pounder just no shit. swimming around the short stack, man. And it was a, like the sketchiest one you could hook one on because it had like two foot under the surface was like a pipe rack, like a cage that surrounded it mm -hmm. that came like four foot off the main pipe. So I already knew like, if I hook this dude, he's going to go straight into that fucking thing. and I'm going to lose him. Yeah. So we were in a, I think a 34 foot sport fisher or something of that sort, not meant to fly fish from. <laughs> and, uh, we had plans of going like 90 miles out that day, but we blew a motor before we even got out of the jetties. No so shit. we were like blasting black smoke. And uh, he was like, well, we'll just bounce the rigs. And I was like, yes, I might see a cobia. And just have the fish of that caliber fishing on a boat 15 feet out of the air, standing on a deck, trying not to step through skylights on this badass sport fishing yacht. Like, not ideal, you know? And <laughs> I'm casting down to this fish and he's the very first cast. This fish came right up to, you know, and mouth open. I was like, Holy shit. Like it's, this is it. Like, and he shrugged it. And then he shrugged about nine different other patterns after I changed so much so that like the stoke on the boat, like there was eight or nine of us that trip. Everyone was like back in the back of the boat, like hanging out, drinking. And I'm still just like plowing casts on this thing. And I changed to a, uh, what it? it was a tail hooked finger licking mullet by, uh, Chase Smith, fish chase flies, uh -huh. which 
is essentially a really simple pattern. It's just like EP fiber tapered back and it has like keel weights, like a lot of weight to kind of get it down, but not too much. So it's like with a current offshore, it kind of falls at a, a natural pace. You know what I, I mean? See. Uh, but it's tail hooked. So what was happening was that fish, when he would nip it flies, he was short striking it, just the very mm. tip. And I was like, I got one for you, motherfucker. And I put that thing <laughs> on. I was like, if he looks at this thing sideways, he's going to catch that hook. Yeah. And when I laid that fly on him, dude, the first cast with it, he just, and I was like, holy shit, he just ate. And I'm like screaming to the captain up in the top, like, back off the rig. And he got us <laughs> off the rig. And that fish took off away from the rig. And I was like, holy shit, like, I'm about to catch a 55, 60 pound cobia. First one I've ever hooked on my 11 weight rod. I fought that thing for the better part of an hour. No um, shit. We got it to the boat. They were about to leader it. So at this point, I'm not like being careful. I'm like, hell yeah, like resting with the rod straight up. And then that fish kicked, <clears throat> blew that rod up. Damn. Like Damn. completely blew that rod up. And I was like, the whole mood changed, you know, it was like <laughs> from complete victory to just completely distraught. Like, oh my God. <laughs> like, but then I realized like, I still have an eyelid on the end of this stump of a fly rod. Yeah. I'm getting this motherfucker to the boat. And I pumped on him, got him back to the boat in about another 15, 20 minutes. And a friend of mine who will re re may remain nameless, uh, who was probably about 11 white claws deep. <laughs> oh no. Went in for a gaff on the head and nicked the leader. And, oh, no. um, cut that fish off. Now, mind you, this fish is five feet long, kicked up on its side, just whipped at the surface. And it, when he clipped that leader, it just slowly started to sink. And there was a split second where I was like, I'm going to dive in on this. Thing. <laughs> and then I was like, no, there's huge sharks around yeah. and then he come to life and took off. So that was four years ago, three years ago. Oh, man. And just hadn't had the chance at another one since then until recently. Uh, my buddy, Tom Pennington, he owns Port Aransas fly fishing. He's got a panga and he was like, you want to go offshore? And I was like, yes, let's go. And he was like, what do you want to do? I was like, I'd like to find some cobia. And just mess around the rigs and catch whatever we can. He's like, that sounds cool. So, man, we hung out on this rig for probably 40 minutes or so. And I was throwing something that you wouldn't throw at Cobia. I was throwing a, a pretty large bait fish. And what I'm doing out there is we're at those rigs. You're depending on which one you're at. You're in, we were, I think we were in like 49 feet of water. Uh -huh. um, and the fish that we could mark on the GPS were holding way deeper. And I recently had a trip where I was doing this and catching jacks, pulling them up out of 40 feet of water, but I'm putting like a half ounce egg sinker in front of my fly. And I'm just sending that thing down and I put it under my arm and I just double hand strip it as fast as I can to the surface. And you can uh -huh. literally watch fish on the graph. You see the fly and you watch them like coming up after <laughs> that's them. pretty cool. It's like playing a video <laughs> game. It's pretty <laughs> It's cheating, but fuck it. Like, it was fun, you know? <laughs> and, yeah. uh, so I was doing that. We weren't marking much, but I was just sending it down. And Tom is, like, kicking little bits of menhaden and cut mullet off the boat, seeing if we can pull anything up. And it's quiet. We're just, like, not talking, just doing our thing, getting after it. And he's just like, fucking Kobe on. I was like, where? <laughs> and it had come up behind the boat, and he was whipping his fly at it. And I'm stripping this big, heavy-ass thing out of the water. Like, oh, fuck, fuck, fuck. I can't do it fast enough to get there. And uh, he's whipping. He got, I don't know how many casts on it, but it just wouldn't connect. And it swam under the boat. And he's like, dude, it's coming your way. And I just got my fly line and, like, pulling it out of the water. The fish come out to my left side, probably 15 feet off the boat. And I just whacked that thing on the water. And he turned right around and smoked it, dude. Man. No shit. It was not a big fish. It wasn't a keeper. I think they've got to be 40 at the fort to keep nowadays. Really? When I was a kid, they were a lot smaller. Uh, the, yeah. They didn't have to be that big. So I knew it wasn't a keeper, which honestly made it a little easier because for me, like my – one of the very few superstitions I have is I always let the first of a species go. Yeah. No matter what, 
if it's the first one I've ever landed, I let it go. Uh, Cobio would be really fucking hard to do that. With <laughs> I've heard nothing but how good they taste. And uh, so I was pretty thankful. He was like 33, 34 inches. Still mm-hmm. put a great bend in that 12 weight, man. And those fish don't give up, man. Like, unless you just put them to the bricks for a couple hours, like that thing was so green. Like, I don't know how many times I got it to the boat. I was like, here it comes. And Tom was like, he's not ready. And he, ooh, take off again. <laughs> just ripping line out. And man, it was just such a cool fish. And I'm really glad it was small because it, made it a lot easier to let him go and <laughs> right, swim away, right. you know? And those imagine. big fish, man, will beat the living shit out of you when you pull them into the boat. They go ape shit, and they break rods. They throw gear around the boat. So, like, <laughs> the best thing you can do with a keeper cobia is, if you know he's in the limit, just take that pistol offshore with you, man, and <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> plug him between the eyes if you're going to pull him in the boat, you know? But That's a good I've, tip. <laughs> yeah, man. Or a, or a good old kingfish bonker, you know. I'm, yeah. yeah. We're not tree-hugging hippie fly fishermen down here, man. We love <laughs> eating fish. We don't slaughter them all the time, but something special like that, man, that is just yeah. a swimming strip of bacon, you know. I'm Yeah. You're coming home if you're legal, bud. <laughs> yeah. <yep. laughs> no way around it. That's kind of how I feel with stalker trout. Like I just if I come across a stalker trout and I what well, majority of the time I go out for trout, I'm going to keep something to eat like I mean, they're stalkers. It's not like they're native fish or anything like I that. I love the way dog food tastes. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, dude, I've had stalker trout that wasn't bad, but I didn't like it so much. I'd be wanting to go out of my way to catch them for the purpose yeah. of eating them. Yeah. But dude, like I, kind of similar to your superstition, mine is whenever I go out fishing for the first, like that day, if I catch a fish that day, whether it's a keeper or if it's a keeper, regardless, I always let the first one go. Same. Yeah. So I said one of my few superstitions. Same. Yeah. If I yeah. if it's a first cast fish, I'm done. I'm leaving for the day. But if it's first fish of the day, no matter what cast it is, he always swims. Yeah. It's just appeasing the fish gods, you know? Like right, right. Yeah, dude. That's yeah. kind of how I see it. And and for redfish for me, like I love redfish. Like uh, I love redfish on a half show or ceviche. They make a great ceviche. It's been getting harder to let them go because I don't get to go to the coast that often. So what I do is like <laughs> it's kind of a tree. It's like, dude, I man, I can't. I want to, but I can't. I just let them go. But damn, dude, this yeah, redfish are good. If I have a day where they're just coming really easy to the boat, you know, if we're in you know, high singles or double digits, I'll be like, I'm gonna take a couple fish today, you know, like. And maybe we should be letting the stupid ones go and keeping the hard to catch ones. <laughs> but yeah, if I'm having a good day and I'll call the old lady and be like, baby, you want some fish tonight? And she's like, oh yeah, let's eat some redfish. I'll bring, it only takes one redfish for me and my lady to eat. You know what I mean? Right. So one good 24 to 25, I don't keep them much larger and I don't like them in the smaller slot. Because I just yeah. feel like there ain't enough food there for, I got to keep more than one, you know? Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, man. First, first fish of the day always swims. First cast fish of the day ends my trip. That's my three superstitions. That's a good one. It's it's so funny, dude. Like soup, fishermen, like a lot of outdoorsmen, fishermen and hunters in particular, they always have these little, these little things, these little superstitions. It's it's funny. Yeah. It's interesting to me, dude. I, like I love flounder. Uh-huh. I love flounder. Last year, right here next to the shop. Like a little morning session before I come to open the shop, first cast of the day off this ledge in this little cut, stuck like a 23-inch flounder. Oh, my and God, nice. dude. Holy shit. And like a stud. I haven't caught one like that in forever. And I stuck to my guns, man. I let that fish go. <laughs> but I bent my rule, and I took another cast, and I caught a big black drum very next and i was like okay i gotta go to the shop you know trying to scratch the itch. <laughs> but, Dude, is that that big black drum you had uh you took a picture of like in front of your flash shop same spot different day gotcha yeah that thing was a fucking tank dude that creek that dumps out right there there's a big cut and there's it's pretty shallow on both ends and when the tide's high those big fish you know because they're they're upwards of 22 inches tall when they're over 30 pounds yeah um so 
I'm just driving by and holy shit, there's a big back out of the water and rip it out of the rod, take a cast, catch them and go back to the shop. You know, <laughs> it doesn't suck. Isn't this another day? <laughs> That's Dude, crazy, that's man. Awesome. Dude, I've never caught a flounder before. You've never caught one? Dude, I've never caught a flounder before. Not on conventional or fly. Or no. gigged. I've never get like I've never had a flounder in my hand before. <laughs> They're cool fish, man. They're really cool fish. And the fact that they start life as a normal fish with eyes on both sides of their head, and as they yeah. mature, they tilt over and that eyeball migrates. Like, what the fuck? <laughs> <laughs> Dude, they're so weird. And they got some yeah. gnarly teeth too, man. Yeah, it's it's crazy. I've only, I've never been bit by one though. They're not a malicious species, you no. know. Like a barracuda will go out of its way to bite you. A shark yeah. will. Certain other species will. But like I've literally been like digging in their mouth, and there's not even like a like a reaction. Really? Strike. Now I don't go like digging way up in there. Yeah. But man, like never having a flounder in your hand. I can't even fathom that. You know? like, <laughs> yeah, I, I definitely need to change that. Dude, so do you know who Nicholas Bauer is? No, I don't think so, man. So this dude, he, tie, he, he I believe, if I'm not mistaken, he has a uh, fly tying materials company. Um, he does that. They have a YouTube channel. Uh, his team is called Vision Fly Fishing, and uh, they do this tournament called Fly vs. Jerk, and it's this huge northern pike tournament over in Sweden, Norway, and stuff like that. And, dude, he's catching these, like, 40, 50-kilogram northern pike on the fly, competing with dudes that are conventional fishing. Well, they went out, and they made a video a few months back of them halibut fishing on the fly. Dude, dude. that is freaking insane. So were they doing do it, that? like, were they doing it during the spawn when those fish are coming up to the surface? No, or they're were fishing they deep for them with full dredging. sink. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, and, and it's freaking insane. The video is great. I'll see if I can find it. I'll send you the link to it. But, Hell dude, yeah. it's nuts. Like big they, ones or yeah, like, like massive small, freaking halibut. No, like hundred pound ones. Like hundred pound halibut. <laughs> Dude, are they putting weight on their lines? Like how are they getting that deep? I, I honestly just, don't know. Waiting, well, they're they're not fishing forever. like way deep. They're kind of up okay. in the shallower water where it's like 40, 50 feet deep and stuff. Okay. But they're still fishing the bottom. Damn. That's and wild. see, that was the thing. That's why I started adding that weight to mine because it was taking so even with a full sink line, when you add in waves and current when you've got top current and lower current in the water columns like i could be standing there for eight minutes trying to get it down you know what i mean yeah. so that's either a really slow patient game or they're doing the same shit i'm doing putting a lead or a really really heavy fly to pull it down yeah but they've got tungsten infused weighted sinking lines nowadays they've oh, got shit. custom yeah dude they've got all sorts of shit nowadays. That's insane. I can't even imagine how expensive those fly lines are. <laughs> I wonder. I wonder if tungsten weighted fly line just feels any different to cast too, because that's tungsten is oh, pretty dense. It's got to be. It's got to feel weird. Feel different. I mean, have you cast a full sink line? Yeah, yeah and I don't like it. <laughs> yeah, it's hard. So imagine throwing something that's even more dense and heavy. Yeah, like I just got back from my birthday trip to Michigan, and. I asked my buddies who took us and they were like eight weights, full sink lines. And I was like, what? <laughs> they were like, they're like, yeah, big, fast rivers. We're pulling them out of log jams. Like you got to get it down. And man, like two days, three days straight, nine to 11 hour days of throwing nothing but full sinking lines. I bet your shoulder was killing as you. Fast as you can. <laughs> like by day one, my shoulder hurt. Day two, it hurt really bad and my hand was cramping. And like day three, I had the claw, dude. And I like <laughs> could hardly like hold my rod. And I was like, boys, fuck this. Like I'm gonna put on <laughs> I'm gonna put on a floating line and I'm gonna throw top waters the rest of the day. And it was producing fish. It was producing like smaller fish. Yeah. But at the end of the day, I ended up catching my largest fish of the trip on a size six boogle bug topwater. Really? And the biggest fish of the trip, other than the pike that we caught. But yeah. it was, uh, I was pleasantly surprised to catch a, a good one. And it was the best eat of the trip, like blasted out of the water, did like a cartwheel on the eat, 
And then when that sucker hit the water, was like under the boat in a split second. I was like, holy shit! Like trying to pull him out from under the boat. Dude, that's badass. Dude, I freaking it was love an excellent trip. For smallmouth. I've never fished for big northern smallmouth. I mean, I think the biggest smallmouth I've caught is 17, 18 inches. But those yeah. fish, that's another fish. I mean, kind of like cobia, but not nearly. But they don't stop fighting either. They fight until you have them in hand. Like they are just a fighting fish. I freaking love fishing for smallmouth. And I'll tell you, man, like in the smallmouth community, like my personal best until I went on this trip was 17 and a quarter inches and I caught it in the Guadalupe River. Uh-huh. And in the smallmouth community, anything over 15 inches, no matter if you're doing it in the Guad in Texas or up where I was in southern Canada, essentially, <laughs> um, a 17 inch fish up there is 17 year old fish. Yeah. Damn. So. When I my I topped my PB at my goal was a twenty inch, but that's a twenty year old fish, and that's like the coveted number for diehard smallmouth anglers. Yeah, and anything over fifteen, dude, was bending the shit out of that eight weight rod. Yeah, so I joined this group on Facebook. It's like smallmouth fly fishing group, and I posted about this trip. And these dudes were like, "Holy shit, bro! Like that was your first time up here catching them, like." 18 and a quarter, man, that's a, that's a monster. I mean, we see the pictures of these guys long arming these, you know, they're big fish, but yeah. you see a lot more 20 inchers than are actually being caught a lot. You know yeah. what I mean? Like these guys sit on pictures. They, they're secretive about their spots, mm-hmm. much like trophy largemouth bass fishermen. Yeah. Um, but man, it was just, it was such a cool experience and a fish that I, absolutely love chasing and now i've got the goal of like i gotta get this 20 at some point yeah and Dude, these guys are posting up here little guys and they're super stoked you know and i was with every fish i caught you know because yeah. they're such such prettier fish but down here in texas these guys on average in the guad you're, you're catching nine to 11 inches and people are like oh cool Bloop. and they you know they just toss them not realizing like that's like an seven to nine year old fish our waters are warmer so they grow faster here yeah so it could be five but it's still it's not like a baby exactly it's that's a five-year-old fish (laughs) it's it's crazy crazy. to think about yeah their growth rates are so much slower and and you're right in the south they definitely do grow faster than they do up north but it's crazy up there because i don't know if it's like similar to like how a tree has rings because certain times of year they grow faster but with the fish up there, maybe it's because they grow slower, but they're like freaking footballs, man. Like in the south, they're a little bit more elongated up there. It's like they're always freaking footballs. It's insane. Yep. Every every fish we caught, whether it was six inches or 16 inches, was a football. Like Got like a mini lunker <laughs> had a, a belly on it, big, thick base of the wrist of the tail, like just such cool fish, man, and built like our Guadalupe bass, essentially. They're yeah. just like stouter football shaped wads. Dude, that's um, awesome. But they're river fish. So they're 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 used to fighting current and they're fatter, they're muscular, and they gotta eat more. Yeah. Yeah. Dude, Fowler, have you ever gone to the Devil's River? Tried the small fishing out there? I have. Uh I haven't I haven't caught a large smallmouth in the Devils. Uh <laughs> Mainly because the very first time I went to the Devils, I fished really hard, caught a ton of fish. I didn't get a real – I think I got like a 14-inch smallmouth, uh, but caught some good largemouth. The next couple trips I've been on, for lack of better words, I wasn't focused on the fishing. Uh, (laughs) I ate a lot of edibles. (laughs) Doing a lot of floating and enjoying nature. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Um, the last trip I went on, I think I caught like three fish, but it was probably my favorite trip I've been on. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. It's just, a, it's a special, special place, man. And I don't know if y'all are familiar with kind of what's going on down in the devil's river, but it's Mm-mm. becoming a lot less special. Really? Um, there weren't there talks of, uh, building a state park or something out there. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot more houses being built close to the river. There's a big park that was funded and I don't know all the specifics. So I don't want to get into like what I've heard, but the gist of it is it's not going to be as, 
it's not going to be a secret destination spot for much longer, man. Yeah. Uh, with with YouTube and social media that put it on the map, mm-hmm. and then with that draw being noticed by the state, um, they're pushing for parks and a lot more access. Yeah. Um, which is going to make it real hard on a lot of those guides that rely on those rivers. Yeah. Um, as their main source of income, you know. So, and it's almost kind of uh, how can it con- like self defeating in a way because that was part of the allure of the devils, just the being so remote, going somewhere you can't easily get to, seeing things that you know not everybody gets to see. Yeah. Fishing a like a really, I mean, it's a, it's a it's one of the dark few dark sky areas in the country in the state it's i mean it's it's just for the most part it's just like pretty untouched like it's just it is what it's always been and uh man and so yeah it kind of sucks that that's happening because that's just that's what the devil's is it you is know, it's, man it's the, the water clarity there is impossible to explain to people um my very first trip we launched the boats paddled out and was like man like we went in july for my very first trip so it was hot as hell out there. Mm-hmm. And within minutes of launching the kayak, I was like, I want to take a dip and get wet and like <laughs> then go enjoy the first leg of this trip. And I just hopped out of the f- kayak thinking it was, you know, three, four foot. No, dude, it was like way over my head in that spot. Like it's that Damn. clear that it, it fucks with your depth perception. Like Damn. It's, it's really, really special, man. And, like you said about the dark sky out there, man, like every trip I go every night after I eat dinner, one of my favorite things to do is lay either in an eddy or like holding on to a boulder just in the water, staring up at this night sky, man, and just seeing the most beautiful stars and like shooting stars and picking out planets and shit. Like yeah. it's the clearest sky I've really experienced anywhere other than like south south padre that's the yeah. same sky obviously yeah. but that's another dark sky space down there but yeah man the devils is a very special special place and it needs to be protected and enjoyed by and i, I don't want this to come off like <laughs> exclusive right but like it's not a place you go take the family and hang out for multiple days yeah yeah it's a spot that you go to enjoy nature. And while you can do that with your family on, obviously it's not this, the experience in that sense is not the same as traveling 66 miles down a river. Yeah. You know what I mean? Um, I guess in a nutshell, go enjoy it while you can, man. Um, I was just about to say that. And I would recommend going in the hottest time of the year. It's fucking miserable, hot, but the, you'll see a lot less people out there when it's hot yeah. and the fish don't care, man. That water is cool. Cool. So the top water action is insane. Um, sight fishing to all different species is awesome out there. The small mouth, the large mouth are big in there. Um, as well as being able to catch catfish and eat them at night for dinner. You know, it's, That's we caught a small about. mouth on a, <laughs> on a can line. Like the biggest smallmouth of the trip, the first trip we went on, we set these, we had beer cans tied to a tree, sitting on the bank, tied to a line, to a hook with a little lead with a piece of bait on it to catch catfish. So we'd hear the can dragging, we'd run over there and grab it. Well, the can went off and Mike, uh, my buddy who runs the trips out there, uh, he runs over there and he's like, no shit. And it was like a... (laughs) Two and a half pound smallmouth on a piece of bacon. That's insane. <laughs> Which I guess was like flapping in the current or something, and he just whoop, grabbed it. But I was like, "You got to be fucking kidding me, man!" Like I've been trying to catch one. That Dude, that's freaking yeah. awesome. Well, I guess uh, me and Jose need to make a trip down there. We've been talking about it, and we were supposed to go this past year, but that didn't happen. And uh, yeah, we need to make that happen. Dude, freaking clear skies is one of my favorite things. So me and Jose went to the Buffalo a couple years ago. And it's also it's, a dark sky area. Yeah, it's also a dark sky area. And, and when we were there, it was close to a new moon. You could literally see the Milky Way with your naked eye. It was insane. Hell yeah. yeah, dude. Russ and I, uh, we got some awesome nighttime or night sky shots on that trip. And the water yeah. there was insanely clear too, dude. Like it was 
we just be kayaking. We look over, we see some big ass buffaloes just chilling on the on the on the ground, or sorry, on the substrate. There, some turtles just kind of cruising along. It was it was wild. That, that's that's right. a, dude. That's a beautiful river to float to. That's like always my favorite thing to do, man. Is like sit and watch and observe what's going on under the water, man. As yeah. much as I love fishing, I love watching critters in their natural state. Yep. Probably more than fishing. Like going to the first time I ever visit California, like these dudes, I'm on, like I said, I'm touring around with a punk band. These guys are like, we're in Long Beach. We're going to go shopping on the strip. And I was like, a bunch of punk rockers are going to go shopping. Like <laughs> I'm going to the beach dudes. And I went to the tidal pools and I watched so many critters for hours, dude. And they finally called and were like, where are you at? I was like, I'm still at the beach. And they're like, what? <laughs> I was like four and a half hours ago. Like, yeah, I'm just sitting in the tidal pools checking shit out, man. <laughs> like, yep. always been one of my favorite things to do, man. And I do it here on the beach, on the pier out here behind the shop. Like, dude, I used to go out there on on Port Aransas when the red tide would come in and start looking for all the different critters that are swimming inside the red tide. You can find all sorts of animals in there, and it's good. Like nobody, they pull up and they're like, ah, "I'm not going to be at the beach today because it's so ugly," you know, with all the vegetation there. But dude, I like walking through it. And looking for all this, I mean, you'll you'll find Portuguese man o' wars there. You'll see the jellyfish. You'll find all different kinds of fish going through that stuff. Little crabs, crustaceans, and whatnot, dude. It's it's awesome. I like watching critters, dude. If you love that, whenever we get the the weed pushing in every year, um, not necessarily the red tide because I hate breathing that shit in. But yeah. when the sargasm is blasting in on the beach and everyone's complaining about it, just go out there and wade like thigh deep. Uh And just look at all the grass around you, man. There is cool shit that 90% of beachgoers will never notice. Really? And it's one of my favorite things, man. Like, it's where I saw my first triple tail was in the surf like that during a grass bloom. Really? Yeah, man. Trigger fish. First Texas trigger fish I ever saw was that time of year. That's awesome. Uh, Shrimp, seahorses. I mean, all sorts of shit, man. That you wouldn't really say. That's so freaking cool. Dude, triple tails are a strange looking fish. So I was down in Venice, Louisiana, <laughs> down there fishing for uh, bull reds one year. And um, I saw something in the distance. And it was one of those trips where I was just not being able to see fish. I don't know what the hell was going on with my eyes at the time. I think it was before I got LASIK, but I just couldn't see crap. And like the guide would be like, hey, you know, three o'clock right over there, 50 foot out. And I'm just like, I don't see it. And he's like, just cast. And I'm like, Ah, and you know i was i just i couldn't see anything <laughs> and then i was like i see one and he's like okay like you haven't seen a fish this whole time that i pointed out to you. i was like no i see something out there and then i see the spin come out and i'm like what the hell is that and he's like dude that is a huge triple tail and i was i had like a plantation crab on or something he said fucking cast at it and so like i cast thing. at it yeah <laughs> and i well no it was dude it was i mean it was a solid dinner but it was a good size triple tail no i meant the plantation crab oh no nah, no nah, a smaller <laughs> one <laughs> and uh i was i was casted at it and it, it didn't do nothing and he's like damn he's like dude that would have been so sick but i can't complain because it was probably about five casts later that i caught my 54 inch bull red so no bitch in here. <laughs> Dude, that thing was a blast. I caught it on a nine weight mangrove coast, fought it for about 45 minutes. I thought I was going to break that rod because it kept coming up to the boat and then it would just dig. And I, I didn't know what that rod could handle because it was the first, I just bought it. I'd never used it before. And I was just like, oh, this thing's going to freaking blow on me. But nah, it, I, I brought That's it to the boat bad. three times. It had three good solid runs, finally got it back. And dude, it was God it's so much fun. I need to go back. <laughs> See, my next goal is to break forty, man. Like I still haven't caught up, haven't landed a bull bigger than forty. Really, I've hooked a couple good ones on the jetties, but ninety percent of the time that ends in heartbreak. Yeah, yeah, but, dude. That's. Man, well, that, I mean, that's I've cheated. I, I every time I've caught a redfish, it's been with a guide. I need to get out. I I want to do it DIY. It means a lot more. Um, but I mean, just having that bend is. I mean, it's great regardless. <laughs> and then the crazy oh, yeah. thing about it is that was my first red on the fly. Oh, double one. Right. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm one of, It's weird. My first fish on the fly for most species that I've caught have been like, so my first carp was 35 pounds. My first red fish was that, was that big bull red. My first Rio was, you know, bigger than both my hands. Like, I mean, it was a freaking solid Rio. Um, my first koi was a mirror koi. Um, 
it I, and the, and it was like damn near 20 pounds like my first fish on on fly Jeez. has been freaking massive on everything and i'm like i mean it doesn't ruin it for me my first uh my first cutthroat was what like 20 something inches my first mm-hmm. brown trout was 20 something inches <laughs> like so you're a, we're gonna we're what we call you a one and done angler <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> you're fucking ruined well it's funny because like before that so before i started catching my first of all these different species like all my buddies here would give me so much shit because I'm out there catching freaking top minnows and mosquito fish. And I caught a Northern stud fish one time. I, I didn't even know what the hell it was. I had to look it up, but I didn't even I know. I caught it. Yeah. It was, it was in some Creek up here and I was, I on my back cast was like, that's not my fly. And it was something <laughs> on there. I put in. It's called a Northern stud fish. Like I was catching all these tiny fish. I was catching little fingerling, large mouth and little spots that were, you know, an inch and a half long. And it was funny because I'd just send these to my buddies. I'm like, dude, I caught a hog today and literally catching fingerlings and catching them on freaking you know, like a like a size four woolly bugger. And I'm like, why did it even hit this? Like I caught a top minnow on a woolly bugger that was the same size as a top minnow. I was like, how did that even happen? I caught it in the mouth, too. So I'm like, I don't know. I was cursed there for a while. And then the thing that kicked it off is Jose came up here to Arkansas for my birthday a couple years ago. And first thing I caught was it was like a four pound bass. And then I caught a huge carp and then I caught that cutthroat and then I caught that brown. It was all in one weekend. And then it's been like that ever since. So your first carp was 35 pounds, 30, 35 was pushing. Yeah. Huge. Yeah, there was, you it was you know how many years I fished to catch a 30 pound fish? <laughs> <laughs> I don't yeah. even want to talk. This, this interview is over. <laughs> Dude, and the worst part about it is it came all over me too. I was like, oh, <laughs> dude, dude, like my entire legs were just white. And I was like, this is some bullshit. <laughs> <laughs> so you're fishing during the spawn on a casting at a bunch of fish or what? Yeah. Yeah. So the first one that I caught, I don't know if I've ever disclosed this on the podcast. It was actually a foul hook. Um, so it, I can't really consider that the first, but the first one that I actually hooked in the mouth was actually last year. And it was also pushing 30. So <laughs> You're disgusting. <laughs> <laughs> Where I'll were you fishing it. up there? Uh, literally uh, about 10 feet from my back door right here. <laughs> I live on a little finger of worse. Lake Hamilton. It gets worse and worse. <laughs> <laughs> so that first yeah. weekend, Jose was up here, and I woke up. It was like, what, 6 in the morning? And I was like, bro, do you hear that? He's like, what? I was like, the splashing. He's like, yeah. I was like, dude, those are carp. Let's go well, get actually- them. Before that, he was like, he called me maybe a day or two before I drove up there. He goes, dude, I'm standing here at because it's like a, it's on the lake and part of the lake drains into that little back area that he's talking about. He goes, dude, I'm standing here and I'm seeing koi, I'm seeing gar, I'm seeing carp, dude. They're everywhere and it looks like they're spawning. So he's like, man, I hope you, I hope you get here. I hope when you get here, they're still here. And sure enough, I get there. We tried that afternoon. We didn't get anything. So the next morning. Man, I was like, that was like six in the morning. Russell's like, dude, you want to go? I can hear him jump. I was like, fuck yeah. So we just, we, we grabbed our shit really quick. We went out there and it was hard because there's a bunch of like, there's a bunch of grass, a bunch of reeds and stuff growing in the way. So it was just a pain in the ass to, to, to make a cast. But dude, they were everywhere. We saw a huge koi that was like, I don't even know, man, like three feet long, maybe bigger mm-hmm. than some, some, uh, big gar, some massive carp that he was talking. They were just everywhere, dude. It was insane. Yeah. Damn, that sounds insane. like sounds yeah. like I'm gonna book a trip and come and sleep on your couch hey, during the come spawn. on, man. <laughs> Bring it on. You you want to get pissed off again though? Let, no. Let's let, let's let Jose tell a story <laughs> about what his first carp was. <laughs> well, so I had never hooked a carp, but I've hooked a koi. Caught a koi. That's been that was my first carpy fish, I guess you could say that I ever that I ever caught. And it was on that trip. So we were there. We were I mean, we were been casting for forever. Didn't weren't hook anything. We caught some bass out of there. I think Russell caught that was his biggest bass that he hooked out of that place, no. uh, at least up up until that point. And then, um, dude, I just there's like a little a little pocket of water that didn't have any grass around it. It was like maybe the size of a basketball. And I see a koi kind of slithering through like a snake, man. And he was heading for what that little pocket. Was it? It was gold. Yellow and, and orange, yeah. Like yellow gold. And uh, Chris Koleski, he said it was a dragonfly koi because the fins were super long. Yeah. And uh, they kind of like drug in the water. And then um, like whenever it was kind of weird because whenever you would kind of turn it, the scales would have like a black iridescence to them. Dude, it was fucking beautiful. But um, so I cast it at, into that little pocket and I saw that fish go down. 
and I said I didn't see my fly anymore. I didn't feel it eat, didn't really see it eat, but I just decided to set the hook because, I mean, what, what's it going to cost? So I set the hook, and I felt weight, and I saw that fish just freak out and take off, and I was, dude, I was, I lost my shit. I was like, Russ, I got the gold one. I got the gold one. And he comes, <laughs> dude, he's like, he's hauling ass, and, dude, we're over there, and, oh, man, dude, I was just, I was I was freaking out. I was I was afraid I was gonna lose it, but Russell, man, I, I dude, I should buy you a beer if I haven't already. But he <laughs> he went in the water like he's like he had we were jeans and everything. He was over there and he grabbed this thing. And when he grabbed it, dude, I just start freaking out. And like I think one of the neighbors came out to see what was going on. It was just and we we're just on the two dudes going crazy over Koi. But did you cry? I wanted to. A single tear <laughs> when I released dude. it, yeah, <laughs> dude. It was dude, it was a freaking gorgeous fish too. It's a and butterfly then, koi, not dragonfly. Dragonfly sounds sorry. cooler. <laughs> sorry, butterfly, <laughs> butterfly koi. Yeah, yeah, that thing was freaking awesome. And then the koi That's that I cool. caught was it was uh I looked it up. It's some Japanese word, but it's a uh, it's it's like a mirror of a koi, and it nice. it was cruising. There was a few of them, dude. There's like a school of koi in here. So there's one that is. I want to catch it so bad. I've only caught it feeding twice, and both times I wasn't fishing. By the time I went inside and got my stuff and got out there, it was gone. But it's probably it's about as long as my arm, and it's pure black, and it has these real wispy fins. I wonder if it's a butterfly. But uh, at the end of its tail is just pure white. It's like a bluish white. And Damn, this that's thing's sick. huge, dude. It's gorgeous too. And I want to catch it, but I haven't. I've never been out there fishing while it's there. Um, we have a few like calico colored ones, orange, black, and white. Um, there's a white one, a pure white one. There's a gold one. Is this yellow just a one. pond behind your house? Or oh, what? Lake Hamilton. Yeah, it's a. It's part of Lake Hamilton where they actually have Bassmaster Classics out here and stuff like that. But it's a little finger where the creek feeds into the lake. And so in the springtime, they just come up here and breed. And it's weird because these koi will come in here and they're breeding with the common carp and stuff. And like they're rolling around in the balls and whatnot. Um, but yeah, I saw this one kind of similar to how it was actually real close to the same spot Jose caught his, but it was cruising. There was a big empty spot, probably, you know, the size of, you know, like about as big around as your arms can get. And it was cruising, same thing through the grass. And I casted it just at the very end because I knew it was heading that direction. And I had on this little, it was like a zebra mussel, almost like mollusk type fly and uh, left it right there. And right when it comes into the clearing, I just twitch it and I see it turn. And same thing, I didn't feel it eat, and I just set the hook, and that thing just, zzzz, and it was, I fought it for a good while, and my daughter was in here, and she was, uh, she was up whenever I went out fishing, I called her, I said, I need your help, she's like, well, I said, I need you to come film this, <laughs> so she, she comes outside, <laughs> she's holding my phone, and I, I ended up landing this fish, and I pull it out, it was a male, it came all over me as well, <laughs> and I'm holding this freaking, like, I jump in the water and, like, hug this thing to bring it out of the water, and I was just freaking, like, I was shaking, that fish was so freaking gorgeous, but it wasn't until I grabbed it that I realized it only had a few scales on it, it was just smooth skin, and it was white and gold, and I was like, ah, oh, this fish is freaking awesome, but that's the only koi that's that awesome. I've ever caught. So it not only was a, a mirror butterfly koi, it was, like, probably one breeding cycle away from pre creating like if you get a koi like that or a carp like that that breeds with another one with similar genetics uh -huh. the babies can potentially come out what they call leather where they're completely scaleless really yeah huh. so they were actually that species was actually bred to be easier to cut into for food processing i see really? that's interesting that's why, like, Blackfoot Reservoir in Idaho uh -huh. has so many mirror and potential, like, really close to leather carp because it was stocked to be a food lake way back in the day. And then people were like, ah, oh, carp are gross. And then that went tits up and they just let them go crazy. So I know nothing about that. That is going to be another area that I need to go to because a mirror, like an actual mirror carp is, is something that I want to catch. Granted, you know, the, the koi, that's, that's a big, you know, thing that I've crossed off the list, but I want to catch a regular mirror carp and, uh, oh, so, yeah. yeah, I might just have to go up there. <laughs> have you ever fished a uh, Dale hollow reservoir? I have not. It's like a 33,000 square foot lake and it's a very large, uh, euro carp destination um but the last time i went there i took the kayak the fly rod and i just went walk about on the lake and mm. man on average i don't think the smallest carp we caught on that trip was like 18 pounds really um, 
But Dale Hollow is cool too because you can sight fish to them. I know a lot of guys that do that, but those fish will also like actively hunt and chase down big leech patterns and big bait fish. Really? Um, it's not just a it's not just a drag and drop type fishery. It's send it and let them chase. Dude, it's pretty cool. cool. I, th- I think I heard like in Lake Michigan. Yep. They do, that, do Michigan that too. too. Like they'll hit like woolly buggers and, and leech patterns and stuff like that. Little and I think it's because there's so many gobies and sculpin present that yeah. it's a yeah. relatively slow moving bait fish um, that, is not thick scaled, so they can literally just slurp them in. And I, see. I think they get really keyed in on high protein fauna. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Like easy that, meals. That makes man. Sense. You know, speaking of leech patterns, I recently heard, I don't remember who I was talking to, but somebody was talking about fishing for trout with a leech pattern. And he says that they hit it freaking hard because it's more of a defensive thing because they go and eat the trout's the trout's eggs and stuff like that. That's one thing. I've never sense. caught them on a on a trout pattern or on a leech pattern, but that's something I might want to try. Do it, man. I mean, leeches will work for lots of different species, brother. Yeah. So don't be afraid to get out of the comfort zone and throw shit you haven't thrown. Cause, right. I mean, I throw a Helgramite pattern that I've had in my box for probably seven years on that trip. And it got slurped up. Like, really? I was pumped. <laughs> like, you know, I never seem to be amazed by what fish will eat. Like me and, me and Jose were talking on our uh, episode yesterday with one of his friends that – he, he tied me up some redfish crack and some redfish flies and stuff like that. And I was catching smallmouth up here on them. Like <laughs> I was just, I wasn't having any luck on, on anything that I was throwing. And I had this little blue and orange redfish crack and I was like, we'll throw that on there. And it freaking like two cast in caught my personal best uh, smallmouth at that point. And I was like, okay. <laughs> Hell yeah. I mean, I didn't have a ton of, I mean, I bought some crawfish patterns for that trip, but I all, you'd be, I'd be crazy if I didn't throw like my sight cast free port fiddlers into the box because right. they just look like a little tan crawfish. Yep. So I had like rust, black, black and purple. Dude, that's freaking awesome. Yeah, I, I love fishing, you know, stuff that you wouldn't think would work and then just hammering a huge fish on it. <laughs> None better yep. than that. That last, the last day of that trip was like that. Just like my, for the first carp, because, so I haven't caught carp. I've hooked them before. The first carp I ever hooked was on a Lano bug on my little three-way. I don't even know how that happened, but he just came up, slurped that because I heard something slurping stuff off the surface. That was a bluegill, and I was just fishing with like bass, four bass, and like bluegills. So I'm a little TFO three weight and a little TFO finesse, so super slow. Cast it over there, and I just see these big rubber lips come up and suck that <laughs> thing down, dude. It was over. Like it was just, I didn't have a chance. The, the funyun, the funyun that comes up and eats. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, dude, it was insane. Man, I've. I, it took me years to took me years to finally catch a carp top water so that's awesome that no, i was just about to say that i've never caught one top water i want to though but that's more believable like that's a that's a right time right place kind of thing you know what i mean like there was obviously some bugs yeah. hitting the water that they were keyed in on but yeah that's crazy yeah. Man. that's badass I recently saw something about mulberry flies. I didn't even know that was a thing, but apparently carp will eat the hell out of some yeah, mulberries. Dude, if you're on a bank and there's a mulberry bush, they're opportunistic hunters. If there's if it's the right time of year where those yeah. mulberries are dropping, match the mulberry hatch, dude. Like they're gonna eat those for sure. Yeah, I saw a, a fly time video where they were using these little glass beads that you get from Hobby Lobby and putting them on a string and then just wrapping them around and tying it in. Like super simple to tie, and it looks just like a freaking mulberry. And uh, you can get like dark reds, purples, and blacks and mix. Dude, it looks cool. I was like, I might just tie some of those just to have them for artwork. <laughs> <laughs> like I tied that super simple, but it looks cool because <laughs> I suck at at tying. So, <laughs> so uh, I guess. Before we start getting too deep into this and run out of time, uh, I think we should talk about your shop, man. Yeah, why not? Let's talk about that. So how are you liking the new uh, the new location? Or I guess same location, different it. unit? Yeah, same same building. We're just, we're not the bad kids in the corner anymore. We're up front, upstairs, man, right on the road. Um, yeah, we tripled our square footage. Hell yeah, dude. So how how did the fly trap come to fruition? Like, what made you decide just to, to full send, make it happen? I mean, 
to be a hundred percent honest, COVID was the motivator, right? So mm-hmm. I met some really good people working at Orvis. I uh, met my my friend Joe DeRosier uh, mm-hmm. while I was working the counter there. Ended up fixing a reel for him. Became friends. Started coming down back to the coast and fishing redfish with him, and just got to know each other really well. Became pretty good buddies and. COVID hit, it was kind of rough times for everybody. And I got furloughed and was full-time carp guiding and out of the blue, man, Joe was like, Hey, would you be interested in being a partner in a fly shop? And I was like, well, hell yeah, dude. Like that's literally been a dream of mine. And he said, me and my other friend, my other partner, Eric Sangerhausen, um, man, we want, we want you to be the face of the shop. And we want to open this thing and make it a little different and just do something cool. And, uh, man, I've just been blowing and going since then, man. Talk to my old lady, kind of see if it was possible and feasible. And she was able to transfer jobs. And there's a big backstory there of a domino effect of losing jobs and scrambling for work and shit. But we made it work and... Man, it's been great ever since. Uh, Joe is actually no longer with us. He moved to Florida and is living his best life out there. And so it's just me and my partner, Eric. And Eric's just been such a good partner. Um, I tell everyone he's like the the quietest silent partner you (laughs) could ever think of. But he's not a silent partner. He's very loud about being, you know, part owner, half owner and, starting this thing up but he's just so busy dude yeah it's since day one it's been fowler this is your place i want it to reflect you and i want it to be what you want it to be man so just take the torch and run and that's what i've done with it man and we did two years in that little stepping stone location downstairs to see you know like a if we can launch during covid one of arguably one of the craziest times we're going to deal with in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. If you can launch during that and make it work, it's, you know, the sky's the limit, dude. And we did, man. I had luckily just a, a huge net of people who are willing to support. And I really feel like Rockport needed another option. You know, Uh, it's, it's become a destination fly fishing town and, Dave over at Swan Point Landing, uh, he's been here 15 years. You know what I mean? And people are very, very team team Swan Point, you know what I mean? Which is what I had to kind of show them like, hey, I'm not just a fly-by-night dude trying to come in here and make a buck. Um, I've accepted that I'm never going to be a rich man owning a fly shop. There's just (laughs) – To be rich owning a fly shop, you got to start rich. And brother, I ain't that guy. So (laughs) it's just, for me, it's just a, it's a passion project that can help me, can pay me enough to continue to do it. But it ain't about the money. It's about the community. And there's just not a lot of fly fishing hangout shops left in the country, maybe even the world. You know what I mean? And the camaraderie and family that comes along with what we do is you just can't argue that, you know, if you don't have that, you don't have tight knit communities, you don't have healthy fishery. It's all a big domino effect. Exactly. And I really feel like Rockport needed another option and it's going beautifully now, man. You know, it was pretty rough in the beginning. Not going to lie. I can imagine, but we got where we're at now. And now I'm have the opposite problem of, man, I have to try and fill 3,200 square feet. (laughs) Stay on top of that inventory, you know? It's a good problem to have, I suppose. (laughs) It is. It is. We've got the view you can see behind me overlooks Little Bay. We've got the the big patio with cornhole boards set up out there and some couches. And we watch fish swim by on the days that we're stuck in the shop. And if there's a lot of them, I might lock the door and run down there. And catch them, you know? but, Dude, that's freaking awesome. So what are you going to do with all the extra space? you have any plans? Yeah, man. Uh, we've got some big stuff in the works. You know, obviously still getting uh, new products, filling up wall space. But 
one of my big things I've got going on is I have a couple tattoos and we've had some parties uh, where we've had some of my friends from Austin artists come down. And the first one was like, man, let's try this out and have like a tattoo artist there with some coastal fishy designs. And, you know, he's a fly angler himself. So he understands the anatomy of fish and tattooing actual flies. Uh Um, And we just kind of tested the water with that. And dude, like, we had Casey Anderson here for our one year anniversary party. And I don't know how many tattoos Casey did during the party, but it was nonstop getting tattoo, doing tattoos. And at one point he came to me and was like, Hey man, I'm going to start writing names on a list and I can't tattoo any more people today. He did like, I don't know, like 25, 27 tattoos, more tattoos than you would normally do in a, expo like an all weekend expo God dang. um so i knew there was something there and for the second year anniversary party i had two artists show up and it was my buddy jeremy cook and chris carlton artists out of austin both fly anglers both really good friends of mine and dude it was the same thing like these dudes are doing as many tattoos as they want like chris my buddy who's just a soldier who really wanted to get in on the raffles and be part of the party tattooed the entire evening and didn't stop. And my buddy, Jeremy tattooed as much as he wanted. We actually had three, three tattoo artists. My other friend, uh, Alex Citrone came. So we had three tattoo artists tattooing the whole, the whole time. Dude, that's insane. And with that, seeing how successful that was and seeing not, no successful for them. You know, I don't make any money on a tattoo, but it's just something else to kind of add to this kind of new version of a fly angler, you know, we're not out there in tweed jackets. We're tattooed, crazy, pot smoking, just listening to gangster rap. Like it's, it's crazy the, the, the way it's evolved. Right. And the new evolution of fly angling is not your, your papa's flying. You know, it's, (laughs) a completely different world and so what to get back to what you asked that we're doing i'm actually putting a permanent tattoo station in the shop um i'm getting the shop registered in the health department with as a licensed tattoo shop that's awesome and as far as we know it'll be the first full-time fly fishing and tattoo shop in the world dude that is dude, that's cool. sick so, and it's just going to be cool, man. Like I'm doing like checkerboard, old school checkerboard linoleum flooring. It's like green and white. I've got a, a neon sign being made that says trap tats and has a big crossbones with a giant fly on it. And I've got an 80 year old skin mount tarpon that at one point we thought like, oh, we're going to fix this and it's going to be cool. But dude, redoing skin mounts is like ridiculously expensive. Yeah. So what we ended up deciding was Jeremy is going to tattoo, not tattoo. He's going to paint like blown out old school sailor Jerry tattoos on this tarpon. And he's going to hang in the tar- in the tattoo station. Oh, that's awesome. And we're going to have traveling fly fishing tattoo artists spotlighting throughout the year, as well as a potential full-time artist. So it's just going to be something cool, man. A lot of these people are going to walk in and be like, what the fuck? <laughs> what is that? <laughs> Holy shit, there's a guy getting tattooed over there. Like, it's just something completely different. And it, it adds another aspect to the shop to be something completely off, off the wall, right. out of the fly realm. Dude, that's so um, cool. So getting that, uh, we've got a lot of custom aluminum work that we're getting done, powder coating. Because not everybody can afford a thirty-five thousand dollar skiff as their first boat. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I can't afford one. I'm working on a Carolina skiff right now. All said and done, it's going to have cost me like sixty-five hundred dollars total. Oh wow, that's not um, bad at all. No, yeah. and it's, <laughs> does it pull like a Hell's Bay? Fuck no, it doesn't. It doesn't do anything like a Hell's Bay, but it does everything I want it to do, but nothing well. Right. You know what I'm saying? It's a jack of all trades <laughs> boat. Um, but we're getting my, my friend James Vesley is doing aluminum work for us. We're getting just custom made. If a customer wants something specific, we'll get that made or we're going to have prefabbed 
grab and go platforms, casting platforms, polling platforms, grab bars, just random things because so many guys are jumping on this like John boat skiff idea of everyone. You can, I, I can probably ask you guys right now, like, do you know of a John, a 16 foot John boat sitting somewhere right now? You probably could get for really cheap. Yep. A lot of them up here in Arkansas. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sitting in trash piles behind old man Jerry's house. It's been there for 35 years. Like, and while they are not necessarily polling skiffs, they're worthy enough to get you on the flats yep. and put a slap up platform and a casting platform, a 25 horse Yamaha you find on Facebook marketplace for like a thousand bucks or less. And suddenly you're off the bank. You're not on a kayak. And you're in an entirely different world being able to do something completely different that you've never done for, you know, four or 5,000 bucks. Right. So we're going to have a lot of kind of prefab stuff ready to go. So if someone's got a skiff project, like, come on in. We can get you set up good enough to get out there for sure. Dude, that's so and badass. We're a stiffy oh, dealer, so it's it's literally going to be like a one-stop shop if you're doing a DIY boat or if you just want to upgrade what you've got on your skiff already. You know what I yeah. mean? We've got everything from line maintenance to pulling platforms to actual stiffy push poles. Um, so really pumped about that, man. Like, just – adding another element to the fly shop. You know what I mean? Yeah, dude, that's that's badass. That's so cool. I'm talking about all these random things you're going to put that you can put on a boat though. Have y'all ever watched DOS boat? Hell yeah. Dude, that's what that reminds me of. You're going to you're going to be having a bunch of DOS boats out there coming from your shop. <laughs> <laughs> Pretty much, man. Like my casting platform that I've got that I've had, I actually stole it off my partner's Explore 18. He was selling the boat and he had a custom fly trap, like badass dance floor of a casting platform. Like I'm a big dude and I can take two steps on this. Really? Thing. Like it's a big platform and I feel comfortable on it. Well, anyway, like the boat hasn't been ready. It's still not done. I'm still working on it. Um, but I had it in here kind of sitting on its side because it's it's like a sign. And do you know how many people were like, bro, I want to buy that? And I'm like, that's not for sale. <laughs> That's my platform. <laughs> They're like, dude, I'll give you, I'll give you a thousand bucks for it right now. And I'm like, nope, <laughs> like, I can't get that again. And I stole it from my partner when he was selling his boat. Right. <laughs> Basically, didn't give him a choice. <laughs> so you ain't getting rid of that. That is mine. But just seeing that, I was like, man, there's definitely a, a market for people who are wanting to either upgrade or build something from the ground up, right. and. I figured, why not, man? We'll see what we'll see what happens. I actually almost started a project on an aluminum boat uh, about a year and a half ago, and uh, one of my buddies up th up here, he uh, he's an aluminum welder, and I was like, dude, I said, if I buy this boat, can you do some custom work for me? And uh, he's just been so busy with his bu his business has taken off. Plus, he does a lot of the you know boat houses and docks and stuff here on the lake, living here in Hot Springs. So he's just been so busy. I ended up not buying the boat, and I actually I looked at the boat, and it was not. I mean, it had cracks in it and stuff already. It was beat to shit, like worse than I wanted to even deal with. So I ended up not going with that boat. Um, but like you said, there's plenty of boats everywhere. But I decided not to not to start the project yet. Plus, I live in an apartment. Don't really have a place to keep it. Didn't want to pay storage. So once I buy another house, then that's probably what I'll do is that'll be one of my first projects is, is making my own aluminum, whether it be skiff or riverboat or something like that. Hell yeah, man. Like, and we don't say the S word boat storage. Storage is a bad yes. word. Uh, I've got so many projects, dude. I'm spent. I'm like, I've got th two outdoor boat slips and a 30 foot by 15 foot boat barn <laughs> filled with parts of boats <laughs> and hull. <laughs> I need to sell that shit. Cause I think about it more and more. I'm like, it's been sitting there three years. I'm spending I don't know how much a year right. just for it to take up space and get beat in the sun. I've got a 19 foot 69 Aqua Sport that's got a 2015 115 Suzuki on it that has 21 hours, but it was swamped, not swamped. It didn't sink in Harvey. It was on a trailer, but it weathered the storm, but it get filled with water. And I got it for next to nothing, man. And I've got like $600 into a T top and a brand new lean bar for it. It's just finding the time to do these boat projects. Right. Is if I'm off, 
ninety percent of the time I'm fishing. Yeah, <laughs> it's really hard to be like I'm just gonna go work on the boat today <laughs> when it's all my buddies are out here in the bay just slaughtering fish. I'm like fuck. I'm going yeah, fuck that boat. <laughs> <laughs> fuck that boat. Yeah, I, uh, I find myself from time to time, it's like, oh, I got to edit this podcast episode or I got to get some social crap ready for next week. And then I'm out there and I see the fish and I'm like, yeah, that ain't happening today. I'm going fishing. <laughs> Can we take a minute to talk about how cool that is? The flag? Just a Texas flag waving in the background. I, love it. I've, I fucking miss Texas, man. <laughs> I miss Texas. <laughs> Man, I want to come up there, but you definitely got to come down here. Well, let's make it. We'll make both of them happen. You you have a place to stay if you ever want to come up here. And I mean, it, I'm kind of in a good area because I'm only a couple hours from some of the best, you know, trout fishing in in the state. And then I got the carp right behind me. I mean, I live in the Diamond Lakes area, so we got Lake Washita, which is some of the cleanest water. It's so clean. There's actually freshwater jellyfish in it. Um, we got Lake Hamilton, which had they fish, you know, the Bassmaster Classics here. Uh, we have Lake DeGray where you can catch freaking – I've caught 24-and-a-half-inch pickerel out there before. Um, and then we got, you know, mass – you can go up to the dams, Blakely Dam and Remmel Dam and stuff like that. They have paddlefish. You can catch some massive striper on Lake Washita. Uh, we have the white bass runs here. Um, hybrids go crazy on DeGray. Like, dude, there's so much opportunity for whatever you want. Of course, we got stalker trout at all the dams. So, I mean, whatever you want to get on, you can get on here. So, any time of year you ever want to come up, just give me a holler. <laughs> dude as soon as i have the help in here to watch the shop i'm there bro Come like on <laughs> i love it up there i mean paddlefish are some of the coolest things i've ever seen in real life dude that's one thing that i mean i, I never followed got. one on my kayak for like f- probably five miles one really day. yeah just check just getting ahead of him and like stopping and watching <laughs> him and paddling up some more watching him again i was like dude what a cool thing. It was a a stud paddlefish. Dude, that's crazy. And I will never, ever have anything to do with snagging a paddlefish. Yeah. Like, I know people make their living doing it and whatever, but I just can't ever think. I couldn't fathom doing that. Yeah. You know? Dude, one thing that I do want to try, though, and it may not be I – don't, I don't even know if it's legal anymore. I listened to a podcast recently, uh, but they used to have uh, – paddlefish caviar apparently uh black paddlefish caviar was is one of the best caviars you can eat so i do want to try it <laughs> i mean i know they did uh they did paddlefish as well as sturgeon yeah. i mean they still do that yeah. um just though i mean those species are just so cool to me like literal living dinosaurs yeah. it's insane unfucking evolved for millions of years yep. like that's crazy. And we got them here too. I mean, alligator gar, mm-hmm. smallmouth buffalo, big mouth buffalo, black buffalo. I caught my all first native smallmouth buffalo up fits. in Oklahoma uh, about a month ago. And uh, Grant from uh, uh, Hill Country Flyworks was up here. Actually, it was funny. So I was in Tahlequah, Oklahoma for work. And I knew he was making a trip to go on the upper Illinois. But I, I, I guess I had forgotten what I was thinking. It was a weekend after I was going to be there. And then he hit me up and I was like, dude, like I'm on the Illinois right now. I was just a little bit lower than he was. So I went up and fished with him uh, before the baby came, which if he's watching, man, congrats on the freaking baby. I mean, she's here. She's absolutely Woo! precious. She came congrats, this is Thursday. Man. I think she came two, three days ago. So congrats, man. Freaking exciting. Congrats. Bro. But um, yeah. And so I ended up going fishing with him up there. But right before I met up with him, I went fishing a little further, further down the river and caught my first smallmouth buffalo. I hooked into one, lost it and then hooked into a couple more, and then lost them, and then I finally landed one, and, dude, that's a weird-looking fish. I didn't realize how weird they look because I'd never held one before. That's a weird-looking fish. <laughs> They're a dense, very that dense they are. fish. Yeah. I caught it on a five We got some weight. spots here, man, where we can show you some 40, 50-pound smallmouth buffalo that you can get shots on. Really? Uh, yeah. I haven't landed one that big on the fly. I had one. Probably the worst cart block I've ever had. Uh, I was fishing on a, on a river, and inside the bend of the river is a big shelf, and there's always big buffalo uh-huh. on it. And this thing is in three foot of water with this much of its tail out. You know what I'm saying? Damn. Like big, fat fish, and he's kicking up this huge mud cloud. So I switched to a dark damsel pattern, a small one, and – 
I sent it over there. First cast right where I wanted it, right in the mud plume in front of where I think the fish's head is at. And I feel a thump. I'm like, fucking A. And I set the hook, which is like a hybrid strip and lift. And flying out of the water comes like a four and a half pound largemouth. (laughs) And I've never been so fucking pissed to catch a four plus pound largemouth. Like, and then of course the fish like, Whoa, what's going on? And just like at the slowest pace possible, (laughs) just swam away. And I just watched this behemoth. I'm literally holding the bass and it's like, (gasps) I'm just watching this fish. I was like, Oh shit. Later. (laughs) Dude, we have some massive freaking grass carp up here. And uh, I was actually up with my buddy Caleb up in Fayetteville area, and we wanted to go fish. This was before I, I fished up there with Grant. I hit up the Illinois about two weeks prior to that, and uh, I've heard there's some really good smallmouth on the on the Illinois. And we went, and they got in a bunch of rain. It was blown out, and we were going to take out, and we're actually going to go to the Super Regionals baseball game up there at, uh, at Arkansas. So um, we wanted to get off the river soon enough to be able to make that game. And so we had this perfect, I, I Google planned it and I was like, all right, sweet. We're going to do about six miles on the river. We'll pull out here, go back. We'll make it to the game in time. And right when we pull up to drop his truck off where we're going to pick up at, it was like 11 something. And they're like, oh, we're closing the park at noon because we haven't had enough. It's a kayak park. They're like we haven't had enough customers. We're just going to close early. And I was like, damn it. They said, you could just go to the next park. And I was like, all right, sweet. I'll look it up. It's like four miles away. And I'm like, yeah, we're not doing 10 miles to try to get off on time. So we ended up not doing the Illinois. So then I started looking at areas, and there's a place up there. I think it's like called like Lake Weddington or something like that. But it, I think there's been some world record, maybe state record, grass carp caught out of there, like 100-pound grass carp, 80-pound grass carp. And I'm like, okay, yeah, that's where we're going. And didn't see any, but I want to catch one so bad. I, I have yet to catch a grass Ha-ha, carp. you finally didn't catch a giant <laughs> Dude, that would have been insane for my first freaking <laughs> grass carp to be like 50-plus, like – yeah, someday I'm going to catch one. I haven't caught one yet. That's one of my nerdy claims to fame is if you, at this moment, if you Google search white Amur, which is the one of the scientific names of the grass uh-huh. car, it's my face holding like a 35-pound grass really? car. Damn, that I caught. It was my first grass car I ever caught on the fly Dude, ride. that's awesome. And it's also been, it was posted by Orvis and it says, I was like, hey. <laughs> like that's pretty cool. That's freaking sweet. My buddy messaged me. He's like, "Bro, have you seen this? Like, Google gra- if you Google grass carp, I'm like second or third. But if you do the scientific name, I'm like number one, baby." Dude, I'm that's like, awesome. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's <laughs> awesome. I'm gonna have to give that to you for like a birthday present one year and make like a plaque, put it in your shop, <laughs> <laughs> have the Google print and everything on it. <laughs> Dude, that's freaking legit. Yeah, that was a 35 pound grass carp on a six wave Holy when shit, the river dude. was probably flowing. The river was flowing probably 3,500 or 4,000 CFS on the lower Colorado. No shit. Yeah. I was fly fishing with Ryan Shopper, and we, at this point, were deeply addicted to catching carp in the river. And we're like separate. We paddle up river to this spot where when it floods, this daisy field gets about two feet of water Uh in it. And there's just tails all over the place. And... Most of them are 35, 40 pound grass cart, but also big commons. And Ryan's downriver a bit and he hooks up and I'm like watching him and I look over and right on this little divot of an edge on the side of the river, this behemoth is just like nibbling at a little root ball of a plant that was like unearthed by the current. Uh And I was like, oh my God. And I got up above current and I rolled this fly like two feet in front of where it was feeding at that drop off. So that fly just went pink, 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 and then fell off that edge right next to the root ball. And I watched that fish like, oh, <laughs> and just grabbed it. And I set the hook and in that amount of current with a fish that has a 12, 13 inch rudder on it, it was insane. And Ryan is downriver fighting this like, Good common. It was probably 10, 11 pounds, maybe a little bigger. And he's like, buddy, I might need some help. And I'm hooked up silently, like not saying, I haven't yelled. I haven't said shit. And I'm like, I don't know, man. I think I'm going to need help over here. <laughs> and he lands that fish and he's like, what, what do you have? He's like, kind of like 
why did I have to help you? Right. And then that fist comes up and he's just like, holy fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Not only was it like really long, but it had this gut on it. So when I held it, it's like spilling through my fingers. <laughs> Damn, dude. It was such Damn. a cool fish, man. And even as a carp lover, there's no denying that grass carp are not one of the most de destructive invasives we have on the planet. Um, but having fought that fish in that current first grass carp ever, again, we talked about my rule. I had every intention of killing that fish. And after fighting it for probably the better part of 35 minutes in the river current and being in the backing twice, I... I literally threw this fish like on the bank with the intention of killing it. And normally having caught big ones, European style, those fish usually work themselves to death. Yeah. Like I've had fish die on the line because they were fighting so yeah. hard. So I thought surely this chick's whooped and you know, cut like a minute and a half on the bank. It's still flopping and fighting and like trying to, and I just like went and picked it up and I sat in the water with it. And was like, dude, I can't kill this fish. And like dead serious, like not on the verge of crying, but an emotional moment, like a realization of like, I can't fucking do that to this thing. And Ryan's like two, three feet from my face. And he's like, buddy, it's your fish. You can do whatever you want with yeah. it. And I sat in the water with that fish for like probably 20 minutes, making sure she was cool and sent her down river and. I haven't regretted it a day since, man. Like, and I've killed a lot of grass carp since then. Yeah. Because of how invasive and destructive they are. I watched Lake Austin go from a top five bass fishing lake to not even in the top 50 because of the amount of grass carp that were put in there to help eat the, the, the other invasive of the, the lake right. was, um, what's that, that one weed. That's really hard to get rid of, and it's bristly, and it's just a pain in the ass. Hydrilla? Hydrilla. It's one of the only species of fish that will eat hydrilla. And I just couldn't do it, man. That was such a special fish for me, and yeah. had to let her go, man. Damn. And I mean, don't yeah, there, there's, there's a few fish that I wanted to keep so bad. I, granted, you know, not grass carp, so not because they're invasive, but there's a few fish that I've let go. It's like, I wanted to keep that one, but... Sometimes you just got to, you got to let it go. And you're right. It's, it's an emotional moment. <laughs> and I'm not a hunter. Like I'm not a killer. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Like I feel like the only Texan who's never shot a deer. I've killed more deer with vehicles than I have weapons. I have <laughs> I've never killed a deer uh, with a weapon, only with my truck, unfortunately. Yeah. Killed <laughs> one with a, a scion one time. Ouch. And that sucker destroyed that little <laughs> piece of shit, poor banner. Like... <laughs> Damn. But yeah, I've just never been a killer, man. The only thing I've really ever killed, like just slaughtered, was pigs. Yeah. And for the same reason that I've not only made money catching grass carp, but spent lots of time killing grass carp. Yeah. Um, which as an angler who respects a fish is not an easy thing to do, especially a fish that quite frankly, I'm not going to fucking eat. Mm -hmm. I've grown, the way I was raised is if you kill something, you eat it. Yeah. And I've tried carp. I've tried common carp. While it's not horrible, it's not something I would want to go out and target. Right. You know, it's like the raccoon of the fucking river. You know, <laughs> <laughs> this is not a critter you really want to eat a lot of. Yeah. But I don't think I could eat grass carp. Just the way they smell, the way they, the meat. I mean, I, like I said, I've killed a lot, so I've cut them open. And the back straps actually look good. Yeah. It's like, like gar back straps, big muscular chunks of meat. Uh -huh. but Fuck them carp, <laughs> <laughs> dude. I, I want to eat eat some gar. So I've had gar a few times, but it's the same thing, kind of like the backstrap of it and filleted. And if you don't eat it hot, like it's just freaking rubber. Like you ain't it. It ain't good. The the flavor's really good, but the texture of it, I just can't do it. But I heard somebody saying, or maybe I, I looked it up at one point. We talked about it on a previous episode that people will process the meat. They're like a grinder and make like crab cakes out of it. I want to try mm -hmm. that. That shit sounds good. So I had Gar for the first time at my second year anniversary party. Uh, my buddy David showed up with this like brisket sized chunk of alligator Gar that his neighbor gave him. Uh -huh. 
And he's like, you want to cook this? And I'm like, I don't know, dude. I've never, I've never had gar, but we got a lot of drunk, hungry people here. Like, <laughs> let's cook it and not tell them what it is and tell them what it is afterwards. Yeah. And we did it like bomb style. So it, like a big Pyrex dish lined with tin foil, onions, garlic, tomatoes, everything in the bottom, butter. Season that thing up, laid it in there, and put the same shit on top, and then you close it all up in the on the Pyrex, and you set it on the grill for, I think we did like 45 minutes or an hour at 300. Uh-huh. Um, but when that shit came out, dude, and I took my first bite of alligator gar, like, A, I didn't believe that that's what it was. Yeah. Because it's like the texture, everything about it is it's not fishy. Yeah. It's it was like a it was like a warm brisket. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. <laughs> but it was more like it was kind of like pork chop consistency. You know what I mean? It was really man. And we had it again like a week later. <laughs> like my buddy got one. I was like, bring that shit. Let's eat it. Y'all and, cook it the same way? Yep, did it the yep. same way, man. Huh. I, I need to try fed that. it to another group of people <laughs> and again was like they're like, what is this? It's really good. Like, we'll tell you after your plate's gone. And then it's gone. And they're like, okay, what was it? I'm like, it's alligator gar. And they're like, ha, ha, ha. No, what is it? I'm like, it's alligator gar. Like, <laughs> Dude, that's they're nuts. like, no shit. Like, that shit was fantastic. But I don't condone going out and slaughtering alligator gar. There's another <laughs> living dinosaur. But yeah. If you can get a small one, like in the two, three foot range, everyone should try it. I've never had alligator gar. I've had spotted gar though, and I would assume it'd be very similar. But I've I only had it. I've only had it so. fried, and uh, the, like I said, the taste was really good. But the texture, you know, the guy had already, he was bow fishing, and he cooked it, and I wasn't home, and he had made it. He asked if I wanted some. I said, "Yeah." Well, then I got home about an hour or two later, and it was sitting on the front porch, and so I went and I reheated it up, and uh, I mean, it tasted good. I just the texture was not it for me. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. And I was sober at this point. I was already <laughs> sober. So it wasn't the booze talking. Yeah. Hmm. I might have tried well, that way. California sober. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Damn. Dudes, I think my phone is about to die. It's like sucking the battery out of this thing. Okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, I guess now's a good time to close it out. So for those of y'all that are watching, uh, <laughs> we appreciate y'all watching to the end and uh, we'll catch y'all next time. This has been Wildlife Outdoors. Thanks for listening. Follow us on Facebook at Wildlife Outdoors and on Instagram at wild.life.outdoors. Let's go live life on the wild side.